if Jesus would, would have come to the earth in our day, as opposed to 2,000 years ago, roughly, who do you think he would most be ticked off at? I'll give you two options. I want you to think through this as, before we get into Galatians. Who is Jesus going to be most ticked off at if he comes to the earth today? A prominent atheist scholar or a religious person who teaches works-based salvation? Who's Jesus going to be most ticked off at? And if you want to maybe just get right to it, is Jesus going to be more ticked off at Christopher Hitchens, who's probably the leading atheistic scholar in the world right now, um, writes a book called, or there's Christopher Hitchens, there's Richard Dawkins, all these kind of guys. Dawkins, I think, wrote the book called The God Delusion, basically saying the very idea that God exists is just a kind of a figment of our imagination. Is Jesus ticked off at him or somebody like Joel Olstein? Who's Jesus most going to be, oh, you, he just infuriated with, frustrated with. I think some of us are tempted to look at the guys like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and be like, Jesus would be so ticked at them because they're trying to say God doesn't exist. They're trying to, you know, promote all of this, this atheistic um, ideology. <laughs> But if I were to answer that question, I, I would say Jesus would be most ticked off at not, not the atheist who's trying to get everyone to disbelieve in the existence of God. I think Jesus would most be ticked off at false teachers. People who come bearing the name of Christian, bearing the name of pastor, but are using the Bible or doing all that kind of stuff, but are teaching a false gospel of health, of wealth, of prosperity, of you're made acceptable to God through your works, however you want to say it. Um, so another way to frame that question is, who's more destructive? Jesus is probably going to be most upset with the person that's most destructive to people. Who's most destructive? A false teacher that claims to be Christian or someone who just is trying to promote an atheistic ideology? My answer would be, Jesus is more ticked off at Joel Osteen. And I'm not just trying to pick on him. I'm just saying people who come bearing the name of Christian, but their teaching is not really founded on the good news of the gospel of the grace of God, but the teaching is founded on your own works, your own faith, your own, whatever it may be, what you can do to make yourself acceptable to God or what you can do to make sure God rains down his blessings on you. And the reason I answer that I think Jesus would be more ticked off at the religious person teaching works salvation is because if you just read through the gospel accounts, you see that Jesus gets into furious, not even debates, but just, he, we see that he says, woe to you, stuff like that. Like, we don't use those words really anymore. But that was basically calling a curse out upon someone. And if you go to Luke chapter 11 and look, there's this long thing to where Jesus is teaching and these Pharisees and these scribes who were the religious people teaching a works-based false gospel, Jesus just starts blasting them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He says, you care what people do on the outside, but you don't care about the heart. It's like, woe to you. You only pick the rules of the Bible that you think you can follow, and then you disregard justice and loving people. And the reason I think Jesus is going to be more ticked off at false teachers who bear the name Christian but are teaching a false gospel it's just because, man, he, that's who he was ticked off at when he came. He didn't get really mad at the people that were like, I don't know if I believe God existed. He engaged them and talked with them and helped them think through it. But to the people who said, God will love you if you're good enough, Jesus is like, woe to you. A curse be upon you. This is, I think, staggering for us to remember and realize because a lot of times I think we think the biggest enemy to Christianity in the world are the guys like who are promoting atheism or universalism, things like that. But really the biggest threat to the church, the biggest threat to Christianity is those that say they're within the church, but they teach false doctrine. This actually brings us to our text in Galatians chapter 4. We've been walking through this entire letter that the Apostle Paul wrote and he wrote it to many local churches that were all throughout the region of Galatia. Paul had planted these churches. They responded to the good news of the gospel. They trusted in Jesus. 
he set up pastors and leaders, and then he goes away, and about a year later, he hears that false teachers had entered these churches and started preaching a false gospel. What Paul says, they started preaching another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, it's just a false one. And Paul had come and preached the good news that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. Jesus, who he is, what he's done in his perfect life, in his death on the cross for our sins, in his resurrection from death to eternal life, who he is and what he's done equals everything for us. We are saved and reconciled to God purely by grace, what Jesus has done, through faith, trusting in what he's done for us. So that's the message of the gospel. But these false teachers had entered Galatia and they started saying, yes, it's great that you trust Jesus and that you depend on Jesus to save you. But if you really want to know you're saved, if you really want to know that God accepts you, you need to have faith in Jesus. Plus, you need to obey the Old Testament law, especially laws like being circumcised and eating certain foods and celebrating certain holidays. They would say that it's not Jesus plus nothing that equals everything. It's Jesus plus something. Jesus plus your works, Jesus plus your circumcision, Jesus plus, you know, whatever it may be, they were teaching that we're made right before God by our works. And so Paul writes this letter to these churches. It's not just one, but it's multiple local churches to help save them from this deadly doctrine that these false teachers had come in and started teaching. Because he heard that these Galatians were like, well, okay, maybe we should. Maybe we are made acceptable to God, justified through Jesus and our works. And the whole book so far that we've been reading through, Paul just keeps blasting that false theology, that false gospel and saying, it's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing. Faith alone in Christ alone to the glory of God alone. That's how we are saved. And he, he's done this through talking about their own experience. He's helped argue for the Galatians. Listen, you didn't receive the Holy Spirit. You weren't justified through doing anything according to the law. You were justified through hearing the gospel, trusting Jesus. The Holy Spirit's been at work in your life and in your church, not through you obeying the law, but through you hearing the gospel and believing. He said, just, just as Abraham, all the way back in Genesis 15, he wasn't made acceptable to God through his works, but it says that he believed God's promise to save and God counted him as righteous because he simply trusted and so he's been arguing all throughout the book, all these different angles and his authority as an apostle. And then he gets all the way to chapter 4, verse 12, where we're at today. And he really gives us a glimpse of the difference between a true teacher of the gospel and a false teacher. He gives us really a glimpse of what it looks like to be a shepherd and what it looks like to be a wolf. So the church in the scripture is likened to a flock of sheep. This is not a bad thing. Some people say, well, that's crazy. We're all really stupid then because sheep are really stupid and they have to have a shepherd who guides them. That's not really the point of the analogy. The point is that sheep need a shepherd and they need someone to help them, to lead them, to guide them, to protect them. And so Jesus likens us to a flock of sheep because he knows that we need him and we need other shepherds to, to guide us, to feed us, to lead us, to protect us. So, we are a flock of sheep, and then Jesus has called and appointed and qualified men to be pastors. And that word pastor literally means shepherd in the Greek. We just call them pastors nowadays, but it means shepherd. It's used interchangeably throughout the New Testament, elder, overseer, pastor. Those are synonymous. They mean the same thing as far as the local church goes. What we see, there are shepherds who love, lead, guide, protect the flock. And then we see there are wolves. There are wolves who either pretend to be a Christian, they pretend to be one of the sheep, and they sneak in amongst the sheep, or sometimes, even worse, there are wolves who pretend to be shepherds. That's even more destructive. It's very destructive to the flock when a, when a wolf gets in there in any way, when he pretends to be a sheep, but it's even more destructive when the wolf gets in there and infiltrates the flock pretending to be fooling people that he is actually a shepherd. And so if you know anything, or if you just think about sheep, wolves are about the greatest enemy that they've got. What wolves want to do is devour the sheep. 
What shepherds want to do is protect and love and nurture and help the sheep be who the sheep should be, right? So that's the analogy, and it's beautiful. Jesus speaks not on just some high plane of idealism or, I don't know, this, these high planes of enlightenment that we don't really understand. Jesus is so awesome because he speaks right down on our level. Does anyone say, I have a hard time understanding what a, the reference between a flock of sheep, a shepherd, and a wolf are? Like none of us, we all go, I get that. That's how awesome Jesus is. He wants you to understand. He wants you to know what the church is like and why you have pastors and that you need to watch out for wolves. And so now in Galatians 4, Paul is kind of pleading with them again, don't turn to believe these false teachers. And he really is highlighting that these guys are wolves. They don't really care about you. And he's telling them from the position of their shepherd. The shepherd will tell the sheep the truth. He will warn them against wolves coming in because he loves them and he doesn't want the wolf to come in and destroy them. So we see two things in this text. I say all this to bring us here. We say two things in this text about the difference between shepherds and wolves. I want you to know this because I want you to be on guard and if any of your pastors ever start smelling like a wolf, I want you to go to that person and talk with them in love. Because we don't want to in any way act like a wolf and devour you or use you. We don't want that. We want you to know what God says pastors and shepherds should be. Because we want to be held to that standard. Myself and Pastor Nate and Pastor James who serves down in Shakota... We don't in any way want to disobey what the word says, especially when it comes to pastoring and shepherding you. So I say this because you need to know the truth. We pastors need to continue to be encouraged by it and guided by the truth. And in this text, we see the big difference between shepherds and wolves. The first thing we see that shepherds and wolves serve different masters. Shepherds and wolves serve different masters. The second thing that we see is that shepherds and wolves have different ministries. But let's start with the first one. Shepherds and wolves serve different masters. If you got a Bible, grab it, open it up, go with me or open up your phone, have you read the word. It's also on the screen. Galatians 4, 12 through 20 is where we're at. But we've got to start with this first point because we've got to get the fundamental difference between a shepherd and a wolf. The fundamental difference between Paul and these false teachers, as well as all shepherds and wolves, is not their external actions. The fundamental difference between shepherds and wolves is the master they serve. I want you to see that first of all. It's not the foundational problem is not just they act differently. The foundational problem and difference between a shepherd and a wolf is that they serve different masters. For instance, number one, shepherds serve Jesus for Jesus' glory. Shepherds serve Jesus for Jesus' glory. In verse 13, Paul reminds the Galatians that when he first came to them, he preached the gospel to them. Now don't skip over that. Because friends, the gospel is all about Jesus. The gospel is all about the glory of Jesus, who is so just and holy that he wouldn't overlook us in our sin He's so just and good and righteous that he wouldn't look at us in our sin and rebellion against him and just kill us all as he justly could have. But he came. He's so gracious. He came. He entered into human history. Fully God. He became fully man. He came and dwelt among us in order to love us, in order to serve us, in order to save us. The good news of the gospel is that we are saved, we are forgiven of our sin, we're made righteous before God, not by our works, but by the perfect and sufficient work of Jesus. Friends, realize that when Paul says, I came and preached the gospel to you, it's highlighting the fact that he serves Jesus. As he preaches the gospel of the free grace of God in Christ, he gets none of the credit. The gospel gives credit to no man. The gospel gives all the glory and all the credit to the once crucified, now resurrected Jesus. So as Paul comes and preaches the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done, Jesus is glorified and he's serving Jesus in it. 
In addition, Paul's already established that he is a servant of Christ, not a people pleaser. Back in chapter 1, I believe verse 10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Apparently some of the false teachers in Galatia would say, Paul's not really telling you the truth. He just wants to tell you whatever you want to hear. So don't listen to him. He's a people pleaser. Right before Paul had said this, he said, If anyone comes to you, if I come to you, if an angel comes to you proclaiming a different gospel than Jesus plus nothing equals everything, let him go to hell. And Paul says, Now who am I serving? <laughs> am I trying to please you by what I'm saying? He's like, I'm saying the truth to you. I'm not trying to please man. I'm trying to please Jesus by telling you the truth of Jesus. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's what he says. And I think we resonate with that. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to hold to the truth of what God has delivered to us in his word, you're not going to be a people pleaser. Quite frankly, the further along we go, in society, the more our culture just kind of shifts nowadays, the harder it is to actually be a Christian and to have anyone in the world actually be pleased with you. We believe sex is intended for the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman because that's what God has told us. And people scream, bigots, homophobes. It's like, no, but, but if God has told us something and he's created us, we're going to stick with that. And so it kind of follows that Paul is sticking with the truth of the word. He's sticking with the truth of the gospel. And he's saying, if I wanted to please man, if I was serving man, if I cared about that, I wouldn't be a servant of Jesus. Because Jesus tells me to do a lot of things that natural man does not like. As Paul preaches the true gospel of God's free grace in Jesus, he's serving Jesus and exalting Jesus. Nothing in the gospel makes Paul look good. So it is with all true shepherds. True shepherds love the flock that God has entrusted to them, and they mainly love them by pointing them to Jesus. That's the chief way that we as your shepherds, as your pastors, can love you, is by pointing you to Jesus and how infinitely glorious and satisfactory Jesus himself is. But it is not so with wolves. Shepherds serve Jesus for Jesus' glory, and wolves serve themselves for their own glory. This is the fundamental difference. Not in the actions, but in the master they serve. Now remember, these false teachers came in preaching that were saved by Jesus plus our works. Jesus plus our obedience to the Old Testament law. And they really highlighted, apparently, circumcision. If you don't know what that is, Google it, not Google image. They came preaching that you're, if you're obedient to the Old Testament law, plus you have faith in Jesus, that's how you know you're saved. So they're really highlighting man's works and being saved, which is a false gospel. In verse 17, Paul finally gets to the why. Why did they come preaching that it's Jesus plus your works? Why? Have you thought that throughout the book of Galatians? Like Paul is really ticked at these guys and helping the Galatian church see the truth of the gospel. Why did these Jewish guys come to all of these churches following where Paul had gone and sneaking in after him and preaching this false gospel of Jesus plus your good works. Why did they do that? Verse 17, Paul points out why. He says, they make much of you, talking about these false teachers, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. What he's saying, another way to say it would be, they flatter you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out. Their big goal is that you would glorify them. You would flatter them. You would make much of them. The big reason that these guys had come in and preached this false gospel is because they wanted to be exalted. They wanted to be glorified. They were serving themselves and how is that exactly? Well, as these wolves preach their false gospel of salvation by works, they're exalting themselves because in the end, they're going to be the ones to show the Galatians how to obey the law well enough to be saved. 
So if these Galatians, according to this false gospel, are saved, it's due to these false teachers, these wolves who had come in and said, this is how you are saved. You do this, you do this, you do this. And they're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for telling me what I should do. You're so great. You guys went before us and you earned your own salvation. Now we can earn our own salvation. So these wolves came in so that they could just put more notches on their belt. Look at all these Galatians that have become obedient to the Old Testament law through what we've told them. Now they're Christians. We showed them how. We went before them. They make much of you, so you will make much of them. In addition, these wolves are seeking to glorify themselves by pointing, just pointing to all their converts. If we can, they're thinking, if we can come in and get these people to do what we want them to do and to become very externally obedient to the Old Testament law. In Galatians 6.13, Paul says, They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. What he means is they are telling you that you'll be saved through your works, specifically circumcision, so that they can point to people and say, look at all of these Gentiles, look at all these Galatians that we got to be circumcised. Now they're saved. Look at all. Essentially, they're, I debated on whether or not to say this. We'll just go with it. Essentially, this is how awkward it is. They're like, look at all these circumcised Galatian penises. Look how great we've done at bringing people into salvation. It's like, that's why he says, they want you to be circumcised so they can boast in your flesh, boast in what you've done and how they showed you how to make yourself through your works acceptable to God. See, friends, in the end, wolves don't serve Jesus. Wolves serve themselves. That's the big difference. They want to be glorified. Look at the success of our ministry. Look how many converts we had. These guys used to be pagan idolaters. Now they're true Christians because they've become obedient to the law. So it is with all wolves. They don't seek to exalt Jesus alone. They want to be exalted themselves. They're in it for themselves above all. They love the praise of man. Now, before we move on to really the actions of shepherds and wolves, notice that wolves and shepherds, they both talk about Jesus. They both open the Bible. These false teachers didn't come in saying, it's not the Bible, it's not Jesus. They said, yeah, it's the Bible, yeah, it's Jesus, plus your works. You need to know that false teachers are smart. Wolves are smart. They know how to devour sheep. They don't just come in and say, I'm a wolf. And everyone goes, oh, well, I'm going away then. They come in and say, I love you and I'm going to show you the truth. When inside they're ravenous wolves. Wolves and shepherds talk about Jesus. Wolves and shepherds use the Bible, but for drastically different reasons. Shepherds want to point you to Jesus. Wolves want to sort of point you to Jesus, but more than anything, point you to yourself to look inside or to look to them to show you how to be the good person, show you how to make yourself right before God. And so you need to ask, if you're trying to determine, okay, wolf or shepherd, who are they pointing you to? Ultimately, who are they pointing you to? Are they pointing you to yourself? Are they pointing you to themselves? Or are they pointing you to Jesus? That's the fundamental difference. You will know they're talking a lot about them or they're talking a lot about me, but they're not really talking about Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. That's the big difference. And then as we move on, we see that shepherds and wolves have different ministries. Here's, here's more like the signs to look for difference between shepherds and wolves. I got five things I want to point out to you in this text. Number one, shepherds are flexible and will change everything but the gospel for your good. In contrast, wolves are typically inflexible and they want you to change and do everything the way they do it for their own good. Usually, this is what's crazy. This is, typically, this is how wolves work. They will change nothing except the gospel. <laughs> what a gospel minister, what a shepherd will do Everything else is flexible 
accept the gospel. We're not going to change the gospel. When we get together for worship, that's flexible. Nothing in the scripture says exactly when you should get together. How we do discipleship, that's flexible. What you should wear, that's flexible. We don't all wear the same thing. We say clothes are to keep you warm and cover up your nakedness. Do that, you're good. You don't need to wear a suit. You don't need to wear a dress. If you want to wear a suit, you want to wear a dress, great. No one cares. Super flexible. What music you listen to, what kind of food you eat, what you drink, things like that, that, that's flexible. It's not like we've all got to become one way, but the way, the thing we won't be flexible on, the thing we won't change is the truth of the word, is the truth of the gospel. Typically, one sign of legalistic, works-based salvation, wolves, would be, they don't want to change anything except the gospel. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're saved through our works, not through Jesus. Well, you're changing the gospel. You're saved through our works, these works, just like we do it. I had a friend uh, who told me when he was younger, he went to a church picnic and came up to the pastor. Him and his brother were wearing shorts. And this is, this is way to one end of the spectrum. They were wearing shorts, the pastor's wearing jeans, you know, church picnic. And he said, this is how a Christian dresses. And him and his brother were like, what? And he's like, you shouldn't be wearing shorts to church functions. He's like, what? <laughs> he said, me and my brother left and we never went back. And like I said, that's way on one end of the spectrum, super legalistic people. But that's typically how it works. Be like us. I want you to become like me. I want you to dress like me. I want you to do the same actions as me. Eat like me. Talk like me. Have the same hobbies as me. But as Paul says here, he says, Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also became as you are. What he means is that when he came to Galatia, he didn't just say, I'm a Jew, I believe in Jesus, you guys are not Jews, you have different cultural distinctives. He didn't say, become like me. Paul says, no, when I came to Galatia, I became like you. Flexible. I'm not trying to get you to become a Jew. He's saying, what, when I came to Galatia, I took on your cultural distinctives. I ate like you eat. I talk like you talk. I, all of that. Not being disobedient to the word. He's saying, I'm not trying to get you guys to become a Jewish guy from the tribe of Benjamin like me. He's like, I'm, I'm flexible. And then that's why he can say, become like me. Because he became like them so he could show them the path to Jesus. The theological term is contextualization. He contextualized the gospel. You go into a context and you say... These things are flexible. I'm not going to change the gospel, but I'm going to get to know these people. I'll dress like them. I'll talk like them. I'll eat like them so that I can point them to Jesus. Shepherds are flexible with everything but the gospel. And wolves are typically inflexible. Number two, shepherds trust in God's sovereignty even through suffering. Read with me the last part of verse 12 says, you did me no wrong. He's talking about their former experience when he first came to Galatia. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. In Matthew 10, 40, Jesus says, if people receive you, he's talking to his apostles. If they receive you, it's as if they've received me. So they received him just as Christ, as if he were like Jesus himself. Then he says, what then has become of your blessedness? That's kind of confusing. Another translation says, what then has become of the joy that you felt? What has become of the blessing that you felt? He's saying, you, you received me and you received the gospel at first. You received it with joy, knowing that this is what God has delivered to you through me. Good news of who Jesus is. It's like, what changed? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. The big idea here is that Paul was trusting in God's sovereignty through his suffering. Paul says, I, I wasn't even planning on going to Galatia, honestly. But it was because he got sick somehow. Maybe something was wrong with his eyes. Um, we see in other places he had a thorn in the flesh. He calls some serious part of suffering. At the end of one of his letters, he says, see with the big letters that I'm writing to you. So a lot of people say, maybe Paul had some serious stuff wrong with his eyes. And maybe that's why he says, 
What happened? You guys would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. But the point is this, friends. We wouldn't have this letter to the Galatians if it weren't for Paul suffering and God causing that, allowing that suffering to come upon him so that he had to detour his plans and go to Galatia. It says it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. You received me, all that. The big idea, the big point, what we need to glean from this is that we should make plans, but we shouldn't be so rigid on our plans that if we, if something changes or if we start to suffer, we shouldn't just think, oh, all the plans are destroyed. Sometimes God allows suffering to come into our lives so that we may be changed or so that he may help change other people through us. True shepherds look to God's sovereignty and trust. You know what you're doing. You've got it. I don't know what's going on. But as Paul, he got sick. He had to go to Galatia. And he's like, you know what? I need to preach the gospel to all these people. Maybe that's why I got sick. It's not so with wolves. One of, another sign of what it means to be a wolf is that you look at suffering and sickness and you don't trust that God is sovereign over it, but you look at it and you say, if you're sick or if you are suffering, it's probably because of your sin or God's displeasure. And Paul didn't do that. He went and preached the gospel in this whole region. Friends, I want you to know that God is sovereign over your suffering. Sometimes he allows suffering because he wants to change you. And it's the only way that he's going to change you how you need to be changed. Sometimes it's in our character. Sometimes the good that it brings, you won't see it in this life. Sometimes you won't see it, maybe you won't see it until you see Jesus face to face. But we have promises in the scripture that if you're in Christ, all things work together for good. We don't understand that. But we bank on Jesus and we trust Jesus. And no matter what's going on in your life, know that God is sovereign over it. He will sustain, sustain you through it in Jesus. Shepherds trust in God's sovereignty even through their suffering. Number three, shepherds will tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it. It's a big one. See, the contrast would be wolves will tell you what you want to hear even when they should tell you the truth. Shepherds will tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it. And that, that's one of the big things. And what you want to look at is, do they ever say anything that kind of stabs at me? Do they ever say anything that's almost like surgery and it cuts me open, that it lays me bare? Or are they always saying things that really just kind of make me feel good? Do they say things that make me feel like a better person? Do they just say things that lift me up and it never, I'm never really convicted of sin? So when Paul says, okay, I first came, and you felt all this joy, you felt all this blessing when I preached the gospel to you. What has become of this blessing you felt? Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? He's trying to help the Galatians see, nothing has changed except you. My message hasn't changed at all. You received it with joy. Now these false teachers come in and you're trusting in your works. And now have I become your enemy? I'm just telling you the truth. You're not going to be acceptable to God through your works. You're acceptable to God only through Jesus' works. So it is with shepherds. They do the hard work of telling you the truth. If you've been here the last few weeks, we've talked some about idols. Can any of you say, that was just a complete happy and joyful feeling, talking about the idols that I look to other than Jesus. It's like, no, it, it stinks. Being convicted of our sin at first, it's like we're getting stabbed. It's like we're being cut open so God can do surgery on us and get that out. But you've got to hear it. You've got to hear the truth. That's one of the marks of what it means to be a shepherd. They will do the hard work of telling you the truth. Some wolves don't want to tell you the truth about sin. Some wolves... One in particular I'm thinking of, even when being interviewed, says, you know what, I don't really talk about sin. And he's a pastor, he's a preacher, huge church. I don't really talk about sin. So he says, 
Right? That's like a doctor diagnosing people with cancer and not telling them they have cancer. It's not a loving doctor because I was like, if I told them they had cancer, it may upset them. But they've got cancer. You've got to tell them. There's a, there's a cure. It's Jesus. Friends, if your pastors here at Ecclesia ever stop telling you the truth or ever just start saying things that you want to hear and that all you're hearing is, yeah, this makes me feel good, this makes me feel better, but never really tell you the truth, you need to call us out. You need to hear the truth. These Galatians needed to hear the truth. They didn't need to hear, yeah, maybe you can be acceptable to God through your works. They needed to hear, there is no way you can be acceptable to God through your works, only through Jesus. And yeah, that was kind of a punch in the gut to them because that's what they had started trusting in. But oh, they needed to hear it. Wolves tell you what you want to hear. Shepherds tell you the truth. Number four, shepherds love you like a parent. And want you to be dependent on Jesus. He says, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. Saying, they're, they're flattering you. They're saying, good job, well done, keep going, but for no purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. So they're encouraging these Galatians to be obedient to the law, but not for a good purpose. They're saying, you're doing well, you're doing good, but not for a good purpose. Paul's saying, if someone does a good job, you should definitely congratulate them. I see how Jesus is changing you. I see how you've repented of this, and you're, that's great, good job. He's saying, that's good. But these guys aren't doing that. They're flattering you so that you can flatter them. They're lifting you up so that you will lift them up. They're using you like a prostitute. That's what Paul's saying. Shepherds love you like a parent. I want you to be dependent on Jesus. Wolves use you like a prostitute. They want you to be dependent on them. It says, it's always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I'm present with you. Apparently, the Galatians would act a certain way around Paul, and then they would act differently when he's gone. When Paul's around, apparently they would try to, you know, Act well and love and humble and everything. And Paul's like, that's awesome. I see Jesus working in you. And then he hears that when he leaves, they're different. He's like, it's good to be, you know, it's good to be encouraged for a good purpose. Not only when I'm present with you. And he says, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Here's the thing. You notice that Paul is speaking like a mother giving birth. He's saying, I'm in anguish over you because I hear that you're deserting the gospel. That's how pastors love you. They love you with the heart of a parent. You're my children. I care about you. I want Christ to be formed in you. I want you, there's kind of a twofold way that you can see that. Christ to be formed in you would at first be see you depend on Jesus alone for your salvation. It's like, I'm in anguish until Christ is formed in you. These false teachers who were telling them they could be saved through their works, they didn't care. They didn't care about the Galatians. They were using them. If the Galatians would have rejected their false gospel, they'd have just left. Paul planted this church, leaves, hears that they're deserting, and he writes them this heartfelt, long letter to help them know, no, 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 don't turn. Don't turn to your works, it's Jesus. That's a shepherd. That's how your pastors here love you. We love you like children. We love you and we want you to be dependent on Jesus, just like Paul wants these Galatians We don't want you to be dependent on us. We don't want to use you. We don't want you to be used. But a lot of times, I think Pastor Nate and Pastor James can say yes to this. A lot of times we're just in anguish because we want you to be dependent on Jesus. Sometimes we see certain certain people in the church that it may seem like they're really depending on something else they're looking to idols and they'll say with me 
sometimes it's just anguish. Because we desperately want you to look to Jesus, to trust Jesus, to depend on Him alone. That's how shepherds should love you. We want to get better at that. We want to look to you and know that we will be held accountable for you, that you're just like our children. We don't want to look down on you, but we want you to be dependent on Jesus, not on us. Number five, shepherds want you to be more like Jesus, not themselves. Wolves want you to be like them, so they may control you and boast about you. These Jewish false teachers came to Galatia, and they were telling the Galatians, you need to become a Jew. Ceremonially, you need to be circumcised, you need to obey the law, you need to become like us. But shepherds, as, as Paul goes on to say, he's like, I'm in anguish. Until Christ is formed in you. That's why earlier he says, become like me, because I became like you are. He's saying, I became just like a Galatian, like a Gentile, so I could show you what it looks like to be a Galatian and to trust Jesus and to follow Jesus and be obedient to him. So that's why I became like you. So he could say, as he says in another place, follow me as I follow Christ. The reason shepherds will help you and want to guide you and want to call you to repentance and can at some time say, hey, this is how we do it is because the job of shepherds is to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. Shepherds' job are to show you what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's a high calling, and that is, frankly, terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying to be a pastor and to know that's what we should be doing. That the sheep aren't really going to progress further than the shepherds. The shepherds are pointing the sheep and showing the sheep but what we want more than anything is for you to be like Jesus. That's who you're created to be like. That's who you're saved to be like. And so when we call you to repent and when we are in anguish, it's not because we want you to be like us. As Nate and I talk about frequently, we don't have it together, but Jesus does. We want you to be like him. And we want to continue to do anything and everything we can to help you follow Jesus. To help you be dependent on Jesus. Wolves don't want that. Wolves want you to be like them so they can use you. We want you to be like Jesus so he's glorified. Here's the thing. You need pastors. You need shepherds. Jesus in his grace and in his sovereignty has established the church. We are likened to a flock of sheep because sheep go together. We're not likened to any animal that is autonomous. We're not, good things aren't likened to wolves. Wolves go by themselves. Sheep go in a flock and they have shepherds. Jesus has called and appointed and equipped men to shepherd you, to lead you, to guide you, to feed you, to teach you the word, to show you how to follow Jesus, to love you, take care of you. And you need them. You need us. We need you to pray for us. We need you to encourage us. It's hard. But there, therein lies another reason that it's so important to be plugged in to a local church. Who's looking after you? Who's shepherding you? Are you a sheep that's just kind of not really connected to a fold, to a flock? Are you just kind of on your own? Sometimes you come in. Friends, that's why you need to be plugged in. You need to be shepherded. In Hebrews 13, the writer says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. See, your pastors, we're going to stand before Jesus someday and give an account to Jesus for how we have pastored you, what we have said to you, how we have preached the gospel. We're going to stand before Jesus and give an account for you. We're supposed to watch over your souls. We're supposed to shepherd you. And you need that. He continues and says, let them do this. Let them do this without groaning. Let them do this without it being hard. Don't kick back against them. Let them lead you. Let them guide you. Let them do this without groaning for that would be no advantage to you. You need shepherds. But more than anything, 
you need a chief shepherd. More than anything, you need not just a pastor, you need a senior pastor, Jesus. You need a senior pastor who is flexible. So flexible and not just says, come be like me. So flexible, he came and became like us. Jesus left his heavenly home and came to the earth and became a man. He took on flesh. He became a baby. So that he could enter into the same life that you live. So that he could be sad. So that he could be tempted. So that he could suffer. So that he would know what it's like to be you. Jesus came. That's how flexible he is. And he came to establish our righteousness. He's so flexible, he doesn't say, achieve your own righteousness through your works. He says, I'm going to come down, become like you, and I'm going to live a perfect life. So that when you trust me, you're counted perfect. You're counted righteous. We need a chief shepherd who trusts so much in the sovereignty of God that he was willing to be slaughtered on a cross to save us. That's trust in God's sovereignty through suffering. Jesus suffered for us in our place, bearing our sin, knowing, trusting that three days later he would arise from death to life. Jesus suffered not to rid us from all suffering, but he suffered so that when we suffer, we become more like him. Since he has suffered on the cross for our sins, taken our penalty, taken paying our debt to God, when we suffer, we know it's not because of God's judgment on us. When we suffer, we know it's God's allowing it to work out for good. He's changing something in us. Or he wants to change something in someone else. He wants to give us joy. We need a chief shepherd who's so committed to telling us the truth that he will say things like this. All who commit sin are a slave to sin. But if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. We need a chief shepherd who's so committed to telling us the truth that he will say, he will say things like, I came to seek and save the lost. You're one of them. We need a chief shepherd who's so committed to the truth to say, I'm the only way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We need a chief shepherd who loves us so much that he has promised not to leave us or forsake us. We need a chief shepherd who has promised not to leave us as orphans, but he's now exalted at the right hand of God, and he's promised to one day come back to make everything sad come untrue, to make everything wrong right. He's promised to come back and perfect us who eagerly wait, who trust him. We need a chief shepherd, lastly, who so desperately desires us to be like we were created to be, that he has bound himself to us, that he has given us his spirit, that he has promised to keep working on us, to keep sanctifying us, to keep setting us apart, keep convicting us of sin, keep bringing us to repentance, keep working on our hearts until one day he comes back and perfects us completely. We need a chief shepherd. We need someone higher than pastors. We need the senior pastor. And it's Jesus. Friends, he's who you need. And you need under shepherds. You need pastors in your church that will point you to him. And as long as I'm alive, as long as God gives me the grace to pastor you, we will keep pointing you to Jesus. And if we're not, kick me out. You need Jesus. You don't need me. You need a chief shepherd. And you need under shepherds that will point you to the chief shepherd. He's the one who takes your sin away. He's the one who makes you righteous. He's the one that will never leave you, never forsake you. He's the one that brings you into relationship with God by grace. So the question is, do you trust him? Is your faith in Jesus alone for salvation? Do you know that you can't do anything to make yourself acceptable to God? You can't do anything to make yourself stand before God and be righteous. But Jesus has done everything for you. He lived the life you should have lived. He died the death you deserve to die. And he resurrected and he says, trust me and I will forgive you. I will count you righteous. Do you trust him, your chief shepherd? 
I pray that today you would trust him, maybe for the first time, maybe for the millionth time. But you would again get your eyes fixed on your chief shepherd and pray for your under shepherds, your pastors, to have the grace and strength to keep pointing you to the chief shepherd. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for delivering this book of Galatians to us. We thank you that you are sovereign over suffering and that the reason we even have this letter is because Paul suffered. And you used that suffering to glorify yourself. You used that suffering to bring the gospel to these Galatians. We thank you that you've shown us the difference between wolves and shepherds. I ask you to give us the grace and give us the understanding to distinguish between someone who wants to use us or someone who wants to love us. I ask for the grace that myself and Pastor Nate and Pastor James would continue to point all of your people, all the, the flock that you've entrusted to us, help us to keep pointing them to Jesus. Help us to be the kind of men that we would want our church to become. Help us to be able to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. I ask you to save those who do not yet know Jesus, to open the eyes of those who are blind to the gospel. Help them see that their worth and identity and security doesn't come through their works, but comes only through the finished work of Jesus. I ask you, God, to help them to trust Jesus alone, to put their trust and dependence and faith in him, who he is and what he's done. And for all of us, whether it's the first time or the millionth time, help us to look to our chief shepherd. Help us to be joyful knowing that he will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for your grace. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. I thank you for these people that they sit under the teaching and preaching of your word. I ask you to help all of this come home to our hearts, not just be in our heads. We want to worship you now. So we offer up these songs these offerings and the Lord's Supper, we do all this in response to who you are and what you've done for us in Jesus. And it's in his beautiful, perfect, and resurrected name we all pray. Amen.